you very much. Nice to uh, see a lot of you. There are a lot of uh, familiar faces I see from BMC in here, and it's uh, you know, always good to see familiar faces when you're talking to an audience like this. I also want to tell you uh, a little bit, I think a lot of you guys are very hands-on technical guys, and there was a time when that was me. So today, that is not me. Today, I run a business and I run operations, but as uh, Sangeeta pointed out, I did write a book called Programming Web Components, which was about Java being an active X controls back in 1996. 1996 is when it got released and McGraw-Hill had published it. So in those days, I, was, I used to think of myself as a pretty good programmer. And then uh, in 2000, I wrote another book called Enterprise E-Commerce. And Enterprise E-Commerce was around architecture, software architecture for business to business e-commerce, specifically looking at uh, how do you use the internet to do business to business transactions. And at that point, uh, the book was about architecture because I learned a very important lesson that when you write a book on programming on a technology like Java Beans or ActiveX, the shelf life of those is so small that unless you were going to commit to keeping them current and releasing them more frequently, it was just a lot of work for uh, really no returns. And you don't make too much money writing books like that. And so expect, except when you start writing about architecture or a little bit more about the philosophy or technology, you find that the shelf life of those books is a lot more. And even though I wrote that book in uh, 2000, I got a serious kick out of it when I was uh, in, a, in a meeting in BMC with the, some of the architects. And they started talking to me about service brokers and you know brokering architecture and so on and so forth. And I told them to stop. And I went and picked up my book and I'd written that concept back in 1999 and I said, I'm going to read out what you guys are telling me right now. The only thing is that it took 10 or 12 years for what I'd written to actually happen. So we wrote the book uh, way ahead of our times. But just thought you guys will uh, appreciate a little bit of uh, history. So let me give you some interesting stats. In 1990, 41 million people worldwide had a mobile phone. Today, there are more than 6 billion people. Humans will create more information in the form of data in the next two days than was created in all of history up until 2003. From that time civilization began till 2003, we will create more data in the next two days. No human has won a chess tournament against a high spec computer since 2005. Every two minutes, we take as many photos as all of humanity took during 1800s. In 2014 alone, humanity will post 880 billion photographs. That's 123 photos per person on Earth. Oops, sorry. Yes. There are more than 1,100 photographs that are uploaded to Instagram every second. There is more than 22,000 GB of internet traffic every second. If you had bought this computing power back in 1991, this is the 5S, not even the 6, it would have cost you three and a half million dollars. And if you see this, many of you may know Radio Shack. This is a Radio Shack ad in 1991. And everything that they're selling on this one piece of paper, you find on your phones today. Everything that is in there that is for sale as a separate item, you have that capability in your phone right now. I'm Tarun Sharma. I'm the CEO for BNC Software India. And I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about things that you perhaps don't think about every single day. Uh, you know, a lot of times when you're technologists, you think about the projects and technology trends, but you don't sit, always sit back and look at the big IT trends or not even IT, just trends that are going to change and disrupt your life forever, forever. If you take a look at how you do certain things today, even just 10 years back, 5 years back, you were not doing things like this. 
or even two years back, you were not booking cabs using your mobile devices. Today, Uber has become the way you book cabs or Ola or taxi for sure, whatever they might be. Today, a lot of people tend to use Airbnb when they travel to book their hotels. Uh, people don't go to the bank to the banks anymore for doing most of the transactions. Even for you can go to the ATM machine to get cash, but for most things like moving money from one account to another, to get your loans, to get your statements, to get any of that, you just don't go to banks anymore. A lot of things have changed from the smart time the smartphone was uh, became popular. So 2007 is when uh, I, Apple launched the iPhone, and even though before that there were a lot of MP3 players, nobody had imagined that a phone would change your world forever. But our lives are changing very, very significantly. Now, if you take a look at uh, this concept, again, as technologists, many of you may not have heard of a concept called the moment of truth. The moment of truth was a uh, term coined by Procter and Gamble. And they basically used to have two moments of truth. The first moment of truth and the second moment of truth. The first moment of truth used to be when you walk into a store. So you saw an ad somewhere, and you said, this product, I really want to buy this product. And you would, you would when you walked into the store, it meant you were serious about buying the product. And what people would do is they would go and buy, look at two, three different products, look at which one was the one that they wanted to buy, and then they would buy that product. And the second moment of truth was when you opened the packaging at home and started using the product. And that is, the, that is what caused loyalty. So most marketing organizations wanted to capture the first moment of truth and then companies had to make sure that the second moment of truth delivered the ads or the image that you had created using the first moment of truth. Now, today there is a concept called Zmod. Zmod is zero moment of truth because the entire buying process has shifted a little bit to the left. And so today when you walk into the store, you're not going there to make the choice about which product you want to buy because you've already made that choice based on the internet and the way people buy today. A lot of that ha is based on uh, maybe your social networks. Uh, if you're going to buy a pair of shoes, you know, it, I, I'm very active on Facebook. A lot of times I would see somebody say, hey, I'm thinking of buying an iPad for my kid. Do you think I should buy a Wi-Fi only version or a 3G version? And then you'll see 200 comments where people are giving their advice. So by the time I walk into the store to buy my iPad, I've already decided what it is that I want. The whole mobile revolution is causing people to think about this. How do I get how do I get people to pick my product first? And if you look at what's happening in India, you know, India has been phenomenal from that perspective. Because we tend to just bypass generations of things that uh, people do in the rest of the world. Now here there is Flipkart. For Amazon.com to have launched a mobile app took forever, but Flipkart decided they were going to go mobile first, quicker. Mobile, you know, now I don't even think. Do you see a billboard ever of Quaker's, Quaker.com? I don't even think they have it anymore. If you take a look at the new age applications, Uber. Is there an Uber.com from where you can book a taxi? I don't know. I don't think so. I think you can register, enroll as a driver, but I don't think you can book a cab from your laptop. You can only book your cab from your mobile device. You know, so WhatsApp. WhatsApp just launched a desktop uh, application, by the way. But it has to be tethered to your phone in order to happen. So a lot of things are changing with this. Businesses want to win Zima. Businesses want to build and protect the brand. Jeff Bezos said that. He said, your brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room. Now, brand causes lot of loyalty. This is the second moment of truth. Now, once you got somebody, and unfortunately, you know, in the internet and over, you know, using mobiles and internet uh, offerings, you find that your consumer reviews, they live on forever. So if somebody tweets saying that this product is terrible, that goes into your digital archive and will haunt you forever. And similarly, when things are good, those become machines for you for, uh, to influence people to buy. I'll tell you a story. Uh, this happened to me. Amazon has a movie rental service called Prime. Amazon Prime. And uh, there are many. There's Netflix and you know I, uh, there are many such uh, sites. I was watching a movie on Amazon Prime and I ordered an HD movie. And while the movie was streaming fine, there was a small portion of time, maybe a minute or two, when it stopped streaming in HD and started streaming in SD. And then it went back to HD and streamed the whole movie back in HD. And I didn't think too much of it. I thought, it, you know, it's okay, I had a bad experience. Two days later, I got an email from Amazon saying, we noticed that you had a glitch in your movie watching experience. We noticed that the movie did not stream in the quality you ordered. 
for a small period of time and we would like to refund your money back. Now, there are two things over here. One is that they won my loyalty forever because you know I know that I don't have to complain now. They are proactively watching my experience and they know end user experience, not synthetic transactions that are telling you whether your site is performing or not. They knew I had a bad experience. And the second, can you imagine the big data analytics that has to run in the back end to be able to make that correlation? Because I don't think I was the only one watching a movie at that point in time. There must have been multiple, but for them to single out is like looking at a needle in a haystack. But today, that technology exists and gives you an option to build customer loyalty like you've never had before. This is all happening right now. Not only is the marketing element uh, uh, important, the revenue element is also becoming very important. So now, the CEOs are starting to sit back and say, hey, my whole business is starting to get disrupted. You, Mr. CIO, or you, Mr. CTO, are my technologists. Can you help me think about the business and create more revenue? This is an example of a company called Sanofi. Sanofi is the leader in diabetes care worldwide. And Sanofi is a BMC customer. What the CIO at Sanofi did is he worked and came up with this small appliance which fits onto your Apple device. And uh, if you're diabetic, you can take a blood sample. It stores your blood readings on the cloud. You can also set critical alarms. So if your blood sugar drops below a certain level or goes above a certain level, the system calls the primary care physician and says, this guy's uh, looking like he's in trouble. And the doctor calls you back and instantly either orders to see you or recommends a medication to bring your uh, blood sugars to the right levels. Now, before Sanofi ordered this, the CIO's job was to have maybe 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 doctors that they sold this equipment to and they, they became the CIO's customer. He had to make sure that the, the data was coming in. What happened with this? All of a sudden, every single end user became that CIO's customer. And unless his IT operations could scale, he was very likely to give a poor experience to his customer, the end user. But more importantly, there's a liability. Because we have created this and you said, if you use this, we can guarantee you that we can maybe save your life, or maybe not guarantee, but we think we can save your life, and you missed saving a life, then there is a liability that gets created in this organization. And that bad news could persist forever, which means a greater opportunity, but greater risk by people taking on to these new technologies. But if they don't take these risks now, they will be in a world of hurt tomorrow. Let me show you this slide, and again, you know, uh, you may uh, already know this, but today when we talk about disruption in the world, we always credit technology like IT technology, right? We say, hey, computing, smartphones, these are the things that are changing the world. The truth of the matter is that at this point, there are 12 such disruptive technologies, and all of these will change the way you work, the way businesses operate. And I'll give you examples. So mobile internet is the one we talk about the most. Advanced robotics. 3D printing. If I look at 3D printing, uh, you know, we have a uh, space station in space, and every time they run out of raw materials, we send a spaceship up to take those raw materials. Now you don't have to do that anymore, because what they've done is installed a 3D printer over there. You don't need to send any more spaceships up. So which means that if I can do that there, you can do it everywhere else. Your entire supply chain, which was based on movement of materials, is going to get disrupted because of 3D printing. There are countries like Germany wants to become the center of excellence for 3D printing. They want all their manufacturing to start happening using 3D printing. Can you imagine that level of disruption for them? Autonomous and near autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars. Do you know uh, what is the biggest threat? Uh, who's threatened most by this? Insurance companies. When you have self-driving cars, they don't get into accidents. Uh, there is a report in the next decade Insurance companies make about $200 billion a year in premiums. 90% of that is going to disappear. 90%. Self-driving cars are not a future. You already know Tesla just launched Model D, which is a self-driving car. It's a beautiful car. How many of you know about Tesla Model D? Yeah. This car is fantastic because it integrates with Outlook. And if it knows that you have a meeting at 8 o'clock in the morning, 
the car pulls itself out of the garage and then waits for you. It puts your air conditioning to the temperature you like and it plays your favorite playlist, your music. It plays your, so the car is waiting for you to get in and then it drives you to your next meeting. This is all happening right now. This is not futuristic. Uber is looking at launching driverless cars. They don't want to rely on drivers. They had this big incident in India. Imagine if you have driverless cars. I don't know whether it will work in India or not. But they're going to start launching driverless cars. This threat is real. The CEO of the insurance company, but he, think about that for a second. If the insurance industry topples, the reinsurance industry topples. Reinsurance insures insurance companies. If the reinsurance business topples, it is going to have an impact on banking. Which means a simple thing, a simple invention like that is threatening entire industries that have been built over the last hundred years. There will be more disruption in the next five years than has been in the last hundred years. There's advanced materials, wearable technology, you know, your uh, clothes change color if you're not feeling well. You'll see, uh, you know, a lot of sensors. There are sensors that are ingestibles. They watch your internals and how they operate. So, of course, everybody wears a jawbone. I've seen a lot of people wear it. Tracks how you sleep and how you walk and how much you run. But now you're getting those ingestible sensors and they, they communicate with your Bluetooth devices to and tell you how your internals are functioning. you got the Internet of Things, sensors everywhere. Uh, next generation genomics for better health. People are going to live much longer. Advanced oil and gas exploration. One of the things that you should know is when new technology gets created, the first industries that used to pick those were generally banks. They were always ahead of the tech technology. The difference now with this new revolution is that the old industries are picking. For example, driverless cars. Do you know which industry picked it first? The coal mining industry. The coal mining industry picked up driverless cars because they had to send cars into dangerous territory where human beings would be in danger. They were the first ones to pick it. So what we are starting to see is not the leaders, but what we considered trailers, like oil, oil industries. You know, the, the trailers, they are the ones who are starting to adopt this technology first. So there are many like these. Uh, there's cloud, there's energy storage, there's renewable energy. One disruption is a lot. Twelve simultaneously can only guarantee one thing, that none of the CEOs know what they're going to be doing five years from now. There was a time when CEOs used to write a 10-year vision document. Then the 10-year vision document became a five-year strategy document. The five-year strategy document right now has become a three-year document. You think about your business only in terms of three years, and that too, you're uncertain because you don't know what is going to disrupt you. It's just phenomenal. Jeffrey, Jeff Immelt is a CEO for uh, G, made a big statement and he said, tonight, you go to bed as the CEO of a large industrial manufacturing company. Tomorrow you wake up as the CEO of a start of a software and analytics company. Every business is going to be software. Every business is going to be software. Do you know that for every large project that you do, irrespective of industry, like an airport, if you're building an airport, or you're building a seaport, 40% of that capital expense today is in technology. 40%. Five years back, how much do you think they spent on technology? Ten years back, how much do you think they spent on technology? Very little. Everything is getting intelligent and much, much smarter. Now, this disruption has happened before. Now, this is a photograph. This is New York in uh, early 1900s. I think this is 1902. Do you see a car anywhere? I know the image is not very clear. But what you see over here are horse-driven carriages. These are all horse-driven carriages. Do you see a car there? Even if you look keenly, you may not find it because it's over there. There is a car over there. Now, this is the image of New York City 10 years later. Do you see a horse there? There is a horse over there. But one horse. One horse driven carriage. In 10 years, the face of what people knew as a mode of transport had vanished and completely changed. And today we are back in the same, except the rate of acceleration is way, way too fast. Now when you look at disruption, there are multiple ways disruption happens. One is this bottom-up disruption. You start with something and then you start improving its capability. Today you start with the camera, it does one MP, you know, one megapixel, then you move to three, then you move to four, then you move to five, then you move to twenty-five, there is no limit. So you keep adding features, features, features. 
But this kind of disruption takes a long time. It's very inferior in the beginning. The quality is not great. But over a period of time, it gets better. It takes too long. Second, you have top-down disruption. This is the Tesla Model D. And it's an electric car. You charge it. Now, this is superior from the beginning. This technology. Uh, how many of you know about Tesla as a car? Oh, so, yeah, okay, great. So, you know there is no engine in this car, right? They give you a lifetime warranty. And this car is all software. There is hardware because you, it has to take you from one place to another. The bed is all battery. But if you open the trunk in the back and the front, there is no engine in it. And because there is no engine in it and no movable parts, they give you a lifetime warranty on this car. And this car is maintained by software. And I'll tell you another story. A good friend of mine in San Jose uh, works for BMC Software, owns a Tesla. And uh, when he was driving it one day, he heard some knocking sound in his Tesla. There's a knocking sound. So in the Tesla, on the front dashboard, there is a big iPad-like device. That's a dashboard. And so he went in there and said, I can hear a knocking sound in the support site of Tesla. And they said, it's a known bug. So it's a known bug, so they'll fix it sometime. Two days later, over 3G, they made a software release, and the knocking sound was gone. So, so the knocking sound was fixed. A mechanical issue was fixed with software. Second one, now this they have to do for all the cars, you know, that reported about. This one uh, was, he was driving and he had to, he went over a speed breaker and his car grazed under, so he heard the scraping sound. So he went and locked a ticket and said, my uh, engine's, the, my uh, body's too low, I just grazed a speed breaker. So don't worry about it. They made a software release and took his suspension up a couple of inches. And you know, so he didn't, now his car didn't graze the speed breaker anymore. So you don't even have to take your car into garages anymore. This is now, this is today. The problem with this kind of disruption is that it's too expensive initially for mass adoption. Now again, this was true of Tesla. It is no longer true because the Model D is very cheap. It's only $35,000 in the US. In India, it's not even come. But in the US, it costs only $35,000. And then you get a $10,000 credit back from the US government. So it only costs $25,000 to buy. So uh, this will pick up. And plus, uh, they're putting these charging stations all over the country. On one charge, it goes about 220 miles. And so, you know, uh, now you can, first you could only use it in the city. If you were going like from North Carolina to California, you probably couldn't take the Tesla. But now with them putting these charging stations all over, you actually can start to do that. So these are superior from the beginning, but they're too expensive for mass adoption. Even in software, you will find that this is the same thing that is happening. In the olden days, when you did startup, you had a maturity curve. So people would start communicating using email. Then from email, they would move to some collaborative software. From collaboration, they would move to some CRM software. From CRM, you would then move to ERP. And then you would have a pretty good operation running. Today's startups, like Uber and Airbnb, do not start like that. They start with a full stack. They start with ERP, and they start with making sure that the technology element of their operation is very, very sound. But they're also doing it at a much cheaper, you know, Uber uh, is so cheap. When I was in, uh, in Florida last, I remember landing in, airport in, uh, in Orlando, and I had to go to Disney for a conference, and I took a regular taxi. So it cost me $70 to get to there, and I paid him a $20 tip. So it cost me $90 to go from one place to another, from the airport to the hotel. On the way back, I took Uber. It cost me $30. I didn't even have to pay a tip because Uber says don't pay tips to our drivers. So these guys are now putting technology at much, much cheaper prices than they used to you know, in the past. I just talked to you about big banks. So I think uh, of Uber as this big bank disruption. And a lot of times what happens is that these guys don't get in, into it to disrupt the industry. They don't come in and say, hey, this whole taxi business, we're going to disrupt it. They basically evolve on an idea. So I think there used to be a uh, software company called Lyft which used for carpooling site. And they used to say, if you're going to carpool, just pay some money to the guy who owns the car. And then, you know, it's cheaper for that guy, and then, you know, he can take you wherever you want. Uber's model was just an evolution of that. And they said, instead of carpooling, why don't you just get into the business? If you have a car, become a driver. If you take people from one place to another, here is the standard rate. And uh, before they knew it, they disrupted the taxi industry. And now, of course, they've got to get regulated because taxi industries are regulated everywhere else. And I think that the edge that they might have had, they'll probably end up losing some of that edge once they start getting regulated. But at this point in time, they're worth, I don't know, $40 billion. How much is Uber worth? Does anybody know? They just raised a billion dollars back. The 
pace of disruption is crazy. When the radio was launched, for them to get to 50% user adoption, it took 31 years. TV took 28 years. Social media, only three and a half years. If Facebook was a country, I think it would be the third largest country on the planet, or maybe even the second largest. I don't know what the user stats are right now, but India's 1.2 billion people. Facebook had already crossed a billion sometime for years. I talked to you guys about the threat that uh, simple self-driving car poses to the uh, insurance industry. So this brings me to the point that if software is going to make business, all businesses are going to heavily rely on software. Technology is going to reach all of us, you know, not just us, but our parents and our kids. My seven-year-old son has his own Android phone and he uses that to WhatsApp me and, uh, you know, exchange homework with his uh, friends. So they are starting to use technology. So technology is not for us. Technology is kind of for everybody. But businesses that rely on that technology, which is everybody, have to think about IT in two different ways. We call this bimodal IT, which means that your back end has to be industrialized because all the innovation is going to happen on the front end. And the innovation on the front end means that almost every service that a traditional business gives to its consumer is going to be in digital form. So if first you had to go and, uh, I'm okay on time. If uh, 10 years back you had to go to a bank to transfer money from one account to another, what was the process? How many of you used banks 10 years back? Have you moved money? Okay. So the process used to be you walk into a bank, then you take a form, then you fill the form out, then they give you a token, you know, uh, based on what whether you're going to the teller or something else. Then when your number is called, you go give them the token. Then somebody writes in a register. Then maybe in the back end, they do some data entry to actually move the money from one account to another. And uh, it used to take 45 minutes of sitting in the bank for your number to be called. It took half an hour to get there and then half an hour. So just moving money meant you had to take out about two, two and a half hours uh, from your day to be able to do it. Today, what does what do you do? On your mobile, how, how, how much time does it take for you to move money from less than a few seconds? How do you deposit checks? I don't know in India if you can deposit checks using the mobile. But, uh, you know, I lived in Boston for many years and when I moved back, my banks are still in Boston. And so I got a reimbursement check and all I had to do was take a photograph of the check and the check was deposited. I didn't have to go to the bank, I didn't have to email it, I didn't have to mail it. I just had to take a photo from my iPhone and that was it. That was it. So if you start to see what is happening is that the services are now getting delivered to the consumer. And that CIO, who was used to having a few thousand people, tens of thousands of people to manage, now suddenly has millions of end users. And their experience is very important. Remember at the start I said the brand is really important? Now imagine when you've got millions of users using services much more than they used to when it was brick and mortar. Today, because you can move money from one account to another at the, like that, you tend to do it a lot more. You tend to you say, hey, I got money sitting, this one gives me 1% interest, this gives 5% interest, let me move it. That's what you do, right? Let me move it into fixed deposit, let me move it into... You do it so fast. Because of that, there is a strain on the back end. Because the back end has not evolved. Your legacy systems, core banking systems, are still the same core banking systems that used to run on the mainframe, they still run on the mainframe. They may have modernized them, because the mainframe technology is also getting pretty, uh, pretty snazzy right now. But it's still, the core jobs still run the way they used to run, right? Do you know, because of mobile, how many transactions are up in the mainframe? 40% transactions up in the mainframe. 40%. Simply because you made it simple to use uh, technology to get a service. On mainframe processing, you pay, you don't just pay for the hardware, you pay for pay by transactions to companies like IBM. So these are unbudgeted expenses. And what, who pays for that innovation? Generally the CIO does. And how does he pay it? On the cost of this. So he's, the expectation is reduce cost here, put the money into that. But these transactions are going up. And so companies like BMC look at this stuff and say, how do you manage both? You need industrial IT and innovation IT.
you need both. Innovation happens on the front end, and the transactions happen on the back end. And if you did not take care of the back end, if you did not industrialize your back end for scale, then those services are going to fall apart, and then people are going to be complaining a lot more on Twitter and Facebook, and your brand is going to go for a toss. Yet, you do not have the option to not do that service. Today, when you pick a bank, what is the criteria for you to pick a bank? Only based on the service? Only based on the brand? No. You look at, does he have a mobile app? Can I do, can I pay my bills? Yeah. Your technology is the number one criteria that you use when you pick a bank for, for transaction. Which meant if I'm the CEO of a bank, I do not have a choice to say, I want to keep this cost low, so let me not do that. You have to be able to do both. So that's what BMC does. Our, uh, you'll see it on our uh, logo also. You know, bring IT to life. We think IT and technology is going to be the backbone. It's going to become even more important than it has ever been. It's a great time to be in the software business, guys. So good for you guys. You made good choices. And I think I made a great choice by being in a software company as well. But we look at it from both sides. Consumer, consumerization of IT as well as industrialization of the back end. To me, these are the six big things CIOs have to think about right now. These are the six digital business imperatives. Number one, intuitive experience. You know when we used to do, hey, I've done an SAP implementation. How much time did people spend teaching people how to use this screen or that screen? A lot. How many people taught you how to use Uber? How many people taught you how to use Airbnb? Intuitive. It's got to be the new experience is intuitive. Nobody's going to teach you how to do it. Actionable intelligence, like that story about Amazon, Amazon Prime. Finding that one guy in millions had a bad experience and doing something that retains that guy's loyalty. Actionable intelligence. Agile applications. It was okay in the enterprise days to make a release once every 12 months, one, once every 18 months. With smartphones, how many app updates do you get in a day? If you set out, you know, if you don't, I just see those uh, patches keep increasing. That's why I've said auto update. Because it's just constantly updating. DevOps, I think the speaker before me from Red Hat today talked about the importance of DevOps. DevOps becomes very, very critical in that space. Then there's adaptive automation. If you're going to fund innovation at the cost of existing operation, the only way that you can do it is to reduce the number of people that you need to run that operation. And that, that means heavy automation. The backend has to be heavy automation. So we talk a lot about self-healing systems, self-remediation systems, self-learning systems. Those are all true. You have to be able to focus on not having any manual interventions when you have issues in the backend. They have to be self-healing. Then there is optimized infrastructure and cost. This comes from reducing a lot of the mainframe, uh, mainframe transaction costs. And the way you know IBM, anybody from IBM here? Make a comment on IBM. <laughs> so IBM has a you know a pricing model where they look at how many jobs are running on a machine. And if you have five different machines, they're still going to charge you based on each machine. So if I had 100 workloads, I got 10 here, 10 here, 10 here, 10 here, and 60 here and it crosses my thresholds of how much they're going to charge you for that. And so BMC does a lot of balancing of the workloads to make sure that you don't pay uh, IBM based on, you know, which, uh, because you just weren't able to balance your workloads out particularly. So there's a lot of innovation for us. Sometimes we are able to take the jobs off the mainframe. For example, if I have a database running a query uh, on the mainframe, DB2, I don't need that query to run on the mainframe. If I could have the DB2 instance on uh, on open system, I could fire off the query, run the query here, and they get the results. At the end, I'm interested in the results. I can take workloads off the mainframe and then push them out. So then there is optimized infrastructure and cost, and that frees up the dollars. And then there is compliance and risk mitigation. If the businesses are online, and you're putting technology in the hands of billions of people, you can be sure some of them are going to try to abuse it. Some of them are going to uh, try to will try to abuse it. So you saw what happened with Sony got hacked. Uh, some of these things are devastating for businesses. Target got hacked, you know, with the credit card information getting stolen. So you've got to make sure that your environment is highly secure. And we also know that the next warfare, I don't think, is going to be bombs. Uh, we see them too. But I think the next set of warfare is going to be cyber warfare. There are countries investing a ton of money 
in uh, ensuring that they can compromise. Ima imagine the entire trading network of the U.S. goes down, you can't bring it back up. Can you imagine the losses, what happens with the economy? It's just crazy. So compliance and risk mitigation is the other imperative that we think is, you know, uh, CIOs have to think about. So I've talked about a lot of these things. I won't go into any more detail. But big data, from this what I'll tell you is that big data is really important. Analytics is really important. Internet of Things is a trend that we're starting to see uh, catching on. We're starting to see a lot of, uh, I think now cloud is like old, passe, everybody does it. Mobile is passe, social is passe. But you're starting to see social networks being used in, in ways that you did not even think possible. When we used to think about monitoring, we used to think about monitoring as software agents, right? How, have you guys heard of an app called Waze? W-A-Z-E, it's an Israeli company that was bought out by Google for a billion dollars recently. I love Waze. It's, it's a very simple, it's a driving app. It tells you how to get from point A to point B. But it's a very smart driving app, uh, map, a map application. Because it uses human sensors more than software sensors. So Google's traffic update came in from some traffic control system, so they knew where the jams were. These guys use the social network, so they know, for example, that Ajay is traveling from point A to point B, and it's going to take him 20 minutes to go from A to B. But they notice that Ajay has not reached his spot yet, and his 25 minutes are over, so they detect that there's something that's causing Ajay to be slow. Then they look at who else is going on A to B, and they say, are you guys also seeming like you're a little bit behind schedule? And then they determine that there is a traffic congestion problem. One of those people in there says, I just saw an accident. Now I have correlation. I said, I know that everybody is slow, and I know that there is an accident over there. Then it looks at what is the average time you're taking. So if it was going to take 20 minutes, but you have taken 30 minutes. So Ajay has now reached point B, and it took him 30 minutes. Then it intelligently calculates and says, if I send these guys on this alternate route, uh, then it takes 27 minutes. 27 minutes is better than 30 minutes. So anybody entering point A after that, they automatically reroute them from point B. They are using the social network to gain intelligence and applying that to a very simple problem. That's why they got a billion dollars, because human sensors in the social network are far more accurate than software sensors or uh, somebody sitting in some traffic control system somewhere. The same problem can be applied to businesses like ours. For example, if I have a, I'm trying to deposit a check in a bank, and I'm having a lot of problems. It's just not able to connect. Now I can start profiling. I can say, okay, so this guy is having an issue in depositing a bank, and I know certain things about him. He's on 3G, he's on Vodafone, he's on an Apple device, he's on iOS 8.1, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, he's got uh, his memory utilization is at 90%, you know, so I have a little bit of profile about him. Then I can start to look at, is anybody else having a problem, and find that there's another guy who's also trying to do, he's got an issue. Now I can say these two guys have an issue, and their profile is exactly the same. So the problem might be in the network. And now I can say who else is on the 3G network, on Vodafone, on iOS 8.1, that has a banking app, and I send a proactive notification saying, hey, we are having a problem, don't try to deposit it to check right now. Nobody raised an issue, nobody called the bank to say I'm having a problem. But the bank knew that they were having a problem because of social networks. And so while a lot of people talk about, hey, we need to bring social networks into it, the way you can apply these technologies is very, very creative and very, very innovative. You can remodel everything based on the technologies that uh, are coming, to, uh, coming together right now. So I'll end with this. If there is a job that has become really hard, there are two jobs that have become very, very hard right now. One is the CEO, because he doesn't know what he's the CEO of. Today it's a manufacturing company, tomorrow it's a software company. I know nothing about software, but I'm going to be the CEO of that company. So the CEOs are having a very, very tough time. Can you imagine being the CEO of an insurance company that has $20 billion in premiums coming, and I know in 10 years, 90% of that is gone because of driverless cars. Can you imagine what, uh, what happens? So these guys are struggling, the CEOs are struggling. The second guy who's struggling is this guy, the CIO. The CIO's priorities, because he's got to keep the lights running. He has to bring the cost of the infrastructure down. He has to make sure that it scales as the business scales, because it will scale if the business is successful. He's got to find innovation dollars to be able to take those brick and mortar services 
digital and introduce those. So you have revenues at risk, significant risk. You have expenses that have to be reduced. You have new revenue channels to create between the CEO and the CIO. They're in a huge world of work. But this is what is going to cause the disruption and the innovation and great career opportunities for all of us here in this room. Okay, so thanks. I hope uh, this gives you some light of what's going to happen in our industry and why you should be excited. Thank you. Thank you.